I'm Allison Singer with the Autism Science Foundation, and we're here today at the Yale Child Study Center. We're with Professor Flora Vaccarino. She is a professor of child psychiatry at the Yale Child Study Center, and she's the director of a new program here at Yale called the Program in Neurodevelopment and Regeneration. Thanks so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Can you start by telling us what is the Program in Neurodevelopment and Regeneration? It's a new program we uh, funded about two years ago with several investigators at Yale and has to do with trying to advance our understanding of neurodevelopment and its relevance to many psychiatric disorders and in particular autism related spectrum disorders. So um, it has to do with trying to apply what we have learned about neurodevelopment in several systems, animal models, even the worm or the fruit fly or mice in particular. We've learned a lot about uh, development in these systems and we want to take all that knowledge. We've been working on that as well and I try to apply that to autism, autism spectrum disorder, other disorders of childhood. And that's really the program at Yale where you're utilizing stem cell research and pluripotent stem cells. Can you talk about the potential for stem cells in autism research? Well, maybe I should start telling you what are stem cells. <laughs> okay. um, so a stem cell is a fascinating cell. It's a cell that has the potential to generate every single cell in your body. And uh, these cells are present in typically in very, at the very early stages of development. So when the embryos are very small, typically a few thousand cells or less. And um, they're pluripotent. If you take them, they can generate any other cells. So they're also immortal. That is, they can regenerate themselves. And put in the proper condition, they can, for example, generate a neuron. But okay, those are stem cells, and what, why do we care about them? Uh, well, uh, we do care because each cell is a sort of a representative of an individual. Uh, so you and I are very different, and the way we're different also has to do with how these stem cells at the very beginning stage were able to develop into slightly different organisms. And that is particularly relevant for the central nervous system because the central nervous system is a, the most complex system of our body. It involves billions of cells. They are all connected in many different ways. They form this very complex circuitry. And we think that the reason why there are psychiatric disorders, and in particular autism spectrum disorder, is because there are slight differences in which this circuitry was built in early development. So it may sound paradoxical, but all of this starts at the stem cell stage, because as the stem cells develop into other cell types, each one of them has a propensity to form a different type of neuron or a different type of other cell that can then later interconnect. First they generate other cells and they generate tertiary cells, you know, many different cell types and at the end they connect together and form what's called the central nervous system. So we want to try to understand from studying these cells how the central nervous system is differently built. Now this may sound almost impossible, but uh, there are systems that, uh, you know, in animals people have already started to study these cells. And for example, you can take stem cells, you can make them develop into neurons. Then you can say, okay, I, that's very good, but I'm interested not just in neurons, but different types of neurons. For example, neurons that can form the brain or neurons that can form the spinal cord. These neurons are very different. They perform different functions. So we can do that in vitro already. And are we able to use stem cells from individuals to try to replace or? Well, that's, so there are many different ways in which you can use stem cells. So of course you can take stem cells and if you can make neurons out of them, you can say, sure, I want to try to make a stem cell that is compatible with a certain individual. It comes from a certain individual, so it will be 
totally um, immunologically compatible with that person. And it comes system. from their skin, correct? It comes from the skin. So we take actually a, a tiny little biopsy from the skin of a person, about three millimeters, it's like a grain of rice. Uh, and it's a, a very small procedure that it's like a blood draw, essentially. It's not painful at all, although it, it, is, it is an invasive procedure, you know. You take a tiny fragment of skin and we put that in a tissue culture dish with some media and the cells divide and they make what's called a cell line. That is a set of cells that are able to reproduce themselves and we can freeze and then we can take and develop these cells into something that's very similar to a stem cell. Now this stem cell is not like a generic stem cell, but it's a stem cell that derives from that particular person. So it recapitulates whatever genetic um, uh, uh, constitution might be particular of that person. And so if we can take that cell and now bring that cell back into a pluripotent cell and then bring that cell forward into a neuronal cell. And if we can make a neuron that's a particular kind of neuron, say a brain neuron, and maybe a particular neuronal type of cell that we think perhaps is deficient in a certain disorder, we can try to understand, is this an abnormality that we want to focus on? Is it true? Does it happen in this particular person as opposed to another one? Does it happen in autism? For example, that certain neurons may be underdeveloped or overdeveloped, or they may be looking abnormal, they may be not able to connect to each other in the proper way. And as this is happening in the dish, is there any way to correct that? So, so this is what we're aiming at doing at the moment. It's not so much that we want to take the cells and make cells to transplant them or do things like that. This is not something that right now we're not aiming at because it's not our uh, you know, concern at the moment, although it's possible to do it, certainly with this type of cells, if they're made in the proper way and there are proper quality controls, because you can imagine that taking cells and transplanting them is not, it, it's a fairly delicate issue. What we want to do is simply to make a model, make a model of development, even though it's only in a dish, for a particular individual that would help us to understand sort of go back in time and understand how the central nervous system development might have been different in this person or peculiar in this person as opposed to another one. So should we be collecting, should we be banking skin fibroblasts from individuals with autism and from, from other people to build these lines? Well, we, or is we, it premature to do that? Well, I mean, I think we, we have nothing to lose to do that because, as I said, it's a minimally invasive procedure and if the cells are properly collected, it's a, it's, a, it's a valuable resource, we think. And right now, we're just beginning to make these cells stem cell-like. So we call them induced pluripotent stem cells because we need to, you know, they don't develop into stem cells naturally. In fact, I can tell you that this was discovered only about three years ago or so, that we can do this. Because people thought, and we developmental biologists thought, that once a cell becomes a skin cell, or any cell, it's practically impossible to bring this cell back into a pluripotent cell. So it was a big discovery of somebody who uh, actually found out, uh, and there were previous hints, but this person was able to, uh, this scientist was able to actually do this by using four factors. So you take a skin cell, or you, you can even take a blood cell. You can take different cell types, but skin cells are easy to, to do this with. And you introduce four factors, and this is the key. So today's technologies are, are still limited in the way we can do that. We use viral vectors, some people use proteins, so I mean there are you know, we're, we're still in the beginning stage of this technology and we can do it, but things are constantly improving. So it would be essential that we bank the primary tissue. So um, if the technologies are not optimal today, at least, you know, we have them. And as science goes along and discovers better ways of doing this, we, we do have the primary material to work with. 
Now your lab has also focused a lot on uh, the brain sizes of children who are diagnosed with autism and has really tried to build on what we've learned about the difference in head circumference for children with autism. Can you talk a little bit about your work in that area and what we've learned with well, regard to brain size? Yeah, it's connected actually with this. So we've been interested in, in, in mouse models. We've been studying the mouse uh, brain for uh, more than I don't want to say how long, more than 10 years, 15 years. And we've been interested in the genetic factors that affect brain growth, particularly the cerebral cortex, which is our largest portion of, of the forebrain. Um, and we've been studying several growth factors that affect this, that make the cortex uh, bigger, uh, maybe with a larger surface area, and so might affect cognitive functions and things of that sort. So when we learned that uh, clinicians were actually discovering that uh, children with autism spectrum disorder might have, or some of them, might have a larger brain circumference or head size. We were curious about what that might mean. And um, so I, I have a personal interest and, and, and track record, I should say, in, in knowing what are the factors in embryonic development that control brain growth. And, I'm eager to try to understand what does that mean for autism for two reasons. One is that, number one, it seems that we know very little about this disorder, right? And we know that it's so heterogeneous. However, this change in brain cir head circumference or brain size seems to me is probably one of the most frequent uh, physical or uh, physiological physiopathological abnormalities that we can find in the children. So points to some at least common denominator that we can try to understand. And the reason why is that important is that even though there may be several causes, and we know that from our animal studies, you could have at least 10 genes, for example, that can affect brain size. If you understand how, and, and we know how these 10 genes can converge on common mechanism, those are the ones that really matter. And those are the ones that we can potentially use to try to understand and correct abnormalities because eventually all these factors are converging on a common mechanism. And this is what we want to understand. What this common mechanism is that might affect Brain, differential brain growth in autism, particularly postnatally, because it seems as though these children have an altered trajectory of head growth, that is their brain grows faster and then slows down, uh, at least in some cases. So if we can understand why this happens, maybe that can elucidate some of the mysteries that are underlying this disorder and try to intervene, even though the causes may be different. And that's how we started with our induced pluripotent stem cell project, because we felt, well, rather than choosing rare varieties, maybe we want to just go and see how many children we have that might have an altered pattern of brain growth and start with those, and that's how we did. So that gave us the motivation to look in these induced pluripotent stem cells and their neural cells for something that we already know how to study in animals. And what have you found when you've looked at those children? Well, it's too early to say. We're just at the, right now we're, uh, we're collecting fibroblasts and we're just learning how to grow the cells into neuronal cells. And what we're going to study is, for example, the rate of their cell division, how fast they can actually divide to grow up and what new type of neurons they generate. Because what we know is that some neurons make a larger part of the cerebral cortex than others. So if there is an imbalance between different type of neurons, that could actually explain why the brain of some children may be larger, because some neurons take up more space because they are larger, they have more connections, they go in different places. So um, e even though it may seem um, hard to understand, actually an imbalance in type of neuronal cells may be one of the key factors that can explain the difference in, uh, in brain growth in these children. And do you think down the line in the future we'll be able to use children's own stem cells to go in and correct 
the neurons that have overgrown or those that have not grown enough and, and restore function in that way? Uh, well, that's one, certainly one avenue. It may seem far away, but I don't think we want to exclude anything that's, that's possible and safe for the children. Uh, there are also other ways because we know from our mouse studies that we can uh, induce different type of neurons, their growth and their development using certain growth factors. These are the very same one that was studied in mouse, for example. And so by that's what we're doing now with the cells. We, we, we are trying to modify the certain uh, their, their uh, proportion of neurons of certain types. So we're looking, for example, at neurons that are inhibitory and neurons that are excitatory. And we can influence the relative proportion of these two types of neurons in these human cells in a dish using certain growth factors. So uh, that information can help us because in the future, for example, we can find ways in which we can uh, um, try to correct certain abnormalities by actually using uh, natural substances that are already present in the brain that may be incorrectly represented in certain kids. And how long do you think it will be until this work moves out of the lab and into clinical practice? Well, that's hard to predict and uh, it will require the work of many different investigators, the collaboration of clinicians, the understanding of the public and the families, the fact that you know, we all should be working together uh, towards reaching a common understanding that we, we should try not to block development as something that's foreign to us, but try to understand how that knowledge might apply two children with disorders. And I think if we work together, it may not be too long of a time, but it's hard to say. Hopefully in my lifetime. <laughs> well, we appreciate all the wonderful work you're doing in this area. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.